Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim with uh, L'Oreal TV and L'Oreal Radio, here with James Jacob Prash. And Jacob is live in England, of course. And we're going to be talking about 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to start reading from verse 9. I'm re reading out of the New King James. The coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, Jacob, does that refer to saved Christians or people who may uh, have a false sense of security who think they're saved? Or does that in include the unsaved or both? This is a very vital question on a very vital issue that has to be approached comprehensively and understood in its specific as well as broad context. This question of 2 Thessalonians verses 9 and 10. Um, but as we continue into verse 11, for this reason, God will send upon them a strong delusion or deluding influence so that they may believe what is false. This is very, very serious. Let us first understand the basis of this idea of the Lord sending a delusion. Look with me, please, if you will, to the Hebrew prophet Amos. Amos chapter 9, verse 3. And though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I will search them out and take them from there. And though they conceal themselves from, from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it will bite them. We have a Moriel teaching on charming the snake. The serpent is always Satan's mode as a deceiver. Jesus told the Sanhedrin that they were a generation of snakes of serpents. We are told by Paul in 2 Corinthians that I fear Satan may deceive you as the serpent deceived Eve. The serpent always deceives the woman, being Israel and, of course, in the context of the New Testament, the church in 2 Corinthians. Deceives, Satan as the deceiver. In the book of Revelation, as we pointed out innumerable times, the dragon, that is the persecutor, and the serpent are cast down to you. Persecution, the dragon, and spiritual seduction, the serpent, taking place simultaneously. The serpent is always Satan as the seducer. But as we see in the book of Amos, the Lord will send this seducer. Why? Look with me, please, to First Kings, the first book of Kings, chapter 13 with Ahab and his false prophets. Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah, whose name means he was like unto Yahweh. In Hebrew, it's a similar name to Michael. Spoke to him saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. That is the false prophets. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. And when he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramat Gideon to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered, Go, go up and succeed, and the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Then the king, that was Ahab, said to him, How many more times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep, which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, 
these have no master. Let each one of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramat Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Now, of course, God obviously knew why and how, but he wanted the Sevaot Shemaim, the hosts of heaven, and obviously us to know. That's why God asked the question. <clears throat> it was not as if God did not intellectually know. Of course he knew. He's God. Nonetheless, he continues. Go and entice him and prevail. You do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. Notice something. There were hundreds and hundreds of false prophets up against the true one. The last days will be the same thing. For every true prophet, there will be hundreds of false ones. And that's what you see today in things like IHOP and the Vineyard Movement with the Kansas City false prophets and people like this. For every true prophet, there are hundreds of false ones. But notice, when the people rebel against the Lord and want to follow false prophets, if they will not repent, the Lord will send a deluding influence. You want a false prophet? Oh, I'll send you a false prophet. I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of your prophets and make you believe a lie. Even Satan ultimately must do God's bidding. Even Satan must ultimately act at the behest of the Lord. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 16, we have a very strong indication that the Antichrist will be the Lord's instrument of deception against the reprobate. This is what 2 Thessalonians is talking about. Those who do not love a knowledge of the truth. Is it speaking of believers or non-believers? It is speaking of all who do not have a knowledge of the truth. It is speaking both about the world, obviously, the unsaved, but it is speaking about the backslidden church, the apostate church. Now we continue to read this. And many have tried to say it can't be that because this is unsaved people. In verse 10, they did not receive the knowledge of the truth so as to be saved. We have to understand the use of the word sozo in this context. We've tried to explain before that salvation is past, present, and future. When someone has been saved, when they were first born again, they were justified. But present, we are being saved, we are being sanctified. Future, we shall be saved, we shall be redeemed. We've been saved, we're being saved, we shall be saved. We've been justified, we are being sanctified, we shall be redeemed. Or back, the Lord purchased us with his blood, he has a certificate of ownership, and he's coming to pick up his parcel, as it were. Now let's understand this. We are told the Holy Spirit is the pledge or earnest, as it is translated. The Greek word is something different. It's the Greek word for, uh, for receipt. That he will come and he will pick up that which he has already purchased. When Jesus died and rose from the dead, we belong to him. It's like ordering a Christmas parcel or a Hanukkah parcel, a, a, a present for somebody. You order it online, and then a week before Christmas or Hanukkah, you go to the distribution center with a ticket that you've printed off with your name on it and a number. And there's a matching parcel in the warehouse or the distribution center with your name and the matching number. 
you have the pledge or the earnest that that belongs to me. I bought it. I take it. Well, that's the way we are. Jesus is coming to pick up that which he purchased. That is the Holy Spirit. Those who have the Spirit of Jesus will be led into all truth. However, there will be others who have a lying spirit, even though many of them profess to be Christians. They departed from the truth. Those people will follow Antichrist, just the same as Ahab's false prophets were given over to believe a lie, that God caused them to believe the lie in judgment because they embraced lies. That is what's going to happen at the end of the age with Antichrist, not only to the world, but to the apostate church. Now, one of the ways the Antichrist is going to deceive people, in fact, one of the chief ways we are told here in 2 Thessalonians and also in Revelation 13 is signs and wonders, but not signs and wonders that are authentically from God, the sim beniflaot, we say in Hebrew. These are going to be different. They're going to be pretended. By pretended, it doesn't mean necessarily or magic or trick or sleight of hand or an illusion. It doesn't mean they won't be supernatural. It just means the power on back of them will not be from God. It'll be a demonic power or a satanic power counterfeiting God. To understand this, we always point to Pharaoh's magicians. Pharaoh's magicians, Jonas and Jambres, were able to counterfeit the miracles of Moses and Aaron by demonic power. That is a picture of the way the Antichrist and Paul's prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus by demonic power. Same idea, same thing. The Lord will send this delusion in order to make them believe the lie in judgment. Now, when you see people flocking into stadiums to see these money preachers blowing on people and waving their jackets, Jesus warned us, as we've said many times, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. When you see people chasing signs and wonders like that, they're going to wind up following false ones. It is a wicked and an adulterous generation that seeks a sign. This is not to say that there are not signs and wonders in Scripture. This is not to say there are not miracles and supernatural demonstrations of power. There are. But remember, as we always say, Jesus never had a miracle crusade. He had miracles. He never had a repent he never had anything but a repentance crusade. He never had a healing crusade. He had healings, but no healing crusades. He had miracles, but no miracle crusades. When you see people going to see the signs and wonders, there's something wrong. What Jesus had was a repentance crusade. Scripturally, these signs followed. Jesus never allowed healings or miracles or signs or wonders. He never allowed those things to be the focus of his message or ministry. Notice when people heal people, he usually would say something like, Shh, that's our secret. Keep that between us. Sin no more. That was the real miracle, salvation. It's the diametric opposite of what we see these con artists, money preachers doing today and the ignorant people who buy into them subscribing to. Now, the people who buy into this may do so in ignorance, but once they're shown the truth and they continue to buy into it, they do it in rebellion. As Paul told Timothy, in the last days, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate these false teachers in accordance with their own desires who will turn their ears aside to myths. Well, that is exactly what's happening with the money preachers, with people like Benny Hinn, with people like Kenneth Copeland, with these other deceivers and these absolute Gnostic mystics pretending to be Christian, such as Bill Johnson. That man teaches Gnosticism and mysticism. He does not teach biblical Christianity in any scriptural sense of the word. This is Gnosticism and mysticism. It's occult practice. These things are of demonic origin. Phil Johnson has begun teaching things to the effect that the church 
is not really called in establishing God's kingdom to throw back evil or to oppose evil, but rather to create some kind of relational situation. This is an absolute lie. We are called to do battle with evil as Jesus did. These people are false teachers. Their spirituality is mysticism. And their signs and wonders, even if they were real in the sense of physical science, the spiritual power on back of them is not. It's Ahab's false prophets. It's Jonas and John Bray's. It's <coughs> It's not Jesus. It's what Jesus warned about. Revelation 13, the Olivet Discourse, and in 2 Thessalonians, these counterfeit signs and wonders, which is, again, not to in any way deny authentic signs and wonders, but authentic signs and wonders agree with Scripture. The kind of madness coming out of Reading in Northern California, or that's come out of the Vineyard Movement, or it's come out of IHAP, IHOP with the Kansas City false prophets, or that's come out of the money preaching televangelists. These things are not scriptural. The Lord will send a delusion because they don't love the truth. Remember, Jesus is the truth. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. If people do not love the teaching of scripture, they do not love Jesus Christ. One liar of Satan, a backslider, who Satan got control of and used mightily, was Paul Crouch of TBN. He may have begun right. Many people think he did, and he probably did. But I remember him on TV saying, doctrine is excrement, only he didn't even use the word excrement. No, what was excrement was TBN, not doctrine. Doctrine is the dask of the teaching of Jesus. He actually called the teaching of Jesus excrement. He was a wicked man. Now, of course, he was exposed three days in a row on the front page of the Los Angeles Times for paying hush money in a wrongful dismissal suit that had a secrecy clause about allegations of homosexuality. His wife was caught making out of the car park, the parking lot in Orlando, with the guy who played Jesus at their theme park. Uh, TBN is a complete disgrace, and people like Ed Hinson and other people who, who know better should be ashamed of themselves for being associated with it. It's a mouthpiece of heresy. It is something that Satan has used to discredit the church and deceive Christians. It's not something you can throw brain into and make the toxic stew edible. It's completely corrupted. Nonetheless, this is TBN. What did you see? People who buy into that stuff. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. You want false prophets, saith the Lord? Oh, I'll give you a false prophet. I'll send you a false prophet. And that false prophet is going to be the false prophet of Revelation 13. The Antichrist who points people to the beast. This is going to happen. When the Antichrist and false prophet come, they will not simply be deceptions. They will not simply be something perpetrated by Satan. They will be something that God has allowed as instruments of judgment on a reprobate world and on an apostate church. However, just as in the days of Micaiah, with Ahab's false prophets, who God had the lying spirit in their mouths, there will be people like Micaiah who know the truth. Now, what's very interesting back in Kings is that Ahab knew that Micaiah would tell the truth. He knew the other prophets were not reliable sources. That's really frightening. Many of these people who are teaching error and propagating it really know the truth, or at least one time did. That is the meaning. In judgment, the Lord will send a deluding influence. If people do not love scriptural doctrine, the rightly divided word of God, they do not love a knowledge of the truth. And if they do not love a knowledge of the truth, they do not love Jesus Christ. When he returns, they will not be led of the spirit of Jesus, preparing them for his return. 
they will be led of a lying spirit, a spirit of deception that is going to point them to Antichrist. Many people within Christendom proclaiming to be Christians, many are going to follow the Antichrist and believe it. As I've been saying for years, if people cannot see through obvious false teachers, if you cannot see through an obvious false teacher like Joyce Meyer, if you cannot see through an obvious false teacher like Bill Johnson or Mark Driscoll or Rick Warren, if you cannot see through an obvious proven false prophet like Paul Cain or Mike Bickle, if you cannot see through obvious false prophets like Cindy Jacobs, what is going to happen when the Antichrist and false prophet come? If you can't see through obvious deceivers, what's going to happen when these sophisticated ones and the power of Satan himself arrive on the scene? Unless you love the truth, you're going to fall for it. And if you love the truth, you really love Jesus and you'll believe his word. You'll be led by his spirit. You'll be like Micaiah. You'll understand. You'll know the deception for what it is. But and for the rest, and Jacob, both the, the apostate church, both, the Lord will send a deluding influence upon them to make them believe the lie, just as he did in the days of Ahab with Micaiah. And Jacob, they, they so disparage the word today. They disparage scripture. Bill Johnson and his cronies have had the audacity to say, we don't worship the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. But yet Psalm 138.2 says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. That's Correct. The Lord magnifies his word above his name. Now understand something, Jesus is the Word. He is the Logos incarnate. He magnifies his Word above his name, and his name is the essence of his being. He's as good as his Word, and his Word is his Son incarnate. These people are perverting the Word of God in such a way as to downplay its authority. One of the tricks these people play is to take a verse, again, out of context and in isolation from context and play up one verse out of the context. They forget that we're told in Psalm 119, the sum of thy word is truth. It is everything that the scripture teaches on a given issue, subject, or doctrine that is truth. They like to take one aspect out of the overall context, and that becomes their pretense. Well, that's what these people have always done. But it's something they do under the influence of the serpent. That's how they operate, and that's how they've always operated. Bill Johnson is a very dangerous man. I can't believe how many people lack such discernment and knowledge of God's word to believe such an obvious deceiver. But that would be true about Rick Warren as well, or about Mark Driscoll as well, or about John Piper as well. We live in serious times. The Lord is indeed coming. Now, Jacob... Also, it seems that Global Legacy, which is Bill John, is from Bethel Church, they seem to target planning churches among college campuses, the young. They have over 2,000 schools of the supernatural worldwide. And from their latest newsletter, he says, he, uh, it states, he, meaning God, loves us. He created us, so we are his idea. So he wants his kids back. He doesn't want to punish us. He actually removed us from the garden for our own protection and not for punishment. And then he, go, then he goes on to say that starts the journey of Jesus to bring us into right relationship with, with Christ. It seems the dangerous thing about these cults, and many of these churches are cults, is they mix something that sounds good with something well, bad. And how do we get people out of these churches? Again, we have always point out exactly as you say, that is the way they operate. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, something we've pointed to many times. 2 Peter 2 verse 1. False prophets arose among the people, as there will be false teachers among you. Notice he uses false teachers and false prophets as if they were synonyms. Why? Well, if somebody's doctrine is wrong, their prophecies are going to be wrong. If somebody subscribes or 
teaches false doctrine, it's inevitable that prophecies are going to be false. Why did the fiasco in London of 1990 of IHOP and of Mike Bickle all come to nothing? Why did those prophecies prove false? Well, his prophecies were false, together with those of his homosexual alcoholic partner, Paul Kane. They were false because their doctrines were false. The latter day reign, the man child, this, their doctrines were false. It's inevitable their prophecies will be false. But let's continue. There will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Secretly introduce destructive heresies. Difficult to translate from the Greek, parasogzusin. The way that people like this operate, such as Bill Johnson, they put truth next to error. They use things that are true to camouflage the error, to masquerade the deception. They put truth next to error. Hence, it is always the sum of thy word is true. We're not talking about quibbling about secondary doctrines. We're talking about essential truths here. Can you please reread what Bill Johnson stated? Reread it again. Let's look at it. Yeah, now this again was from his organization, uh, Global Legacy, um, which is part of, of uh, Bethel Church. He says he loved us, meaning God. He created us, so we were his idea. So he wants his kids back. He doesn't want to punish us. He actually removed us from the garden for our own protection and not for punishment. But that begins a journey, a story. And later on, God the Father sends his son Jesus to re uh, restore us to our original design to have a relationship with the Father. And then it goes on to say righteousness isn't rules. Now let's look at what he said about the garden. God didn't remove us the garden because of some kind of a judgment. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And the Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head, you will bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was mother of all the living. And the Lord made garments of the skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Notice God is plural. Speaking within the context of the Trinity. Knowing good and evil. And now, let, lest he stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord has sent them out from the garden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out at the east of the Garden of Eden, and he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. The scripture tells us that the Lord removed us from the garden to prevent us from living eternally, perpetually in sin. That is why he did it, to stop us from living perpetually in sin. Now God begins by cursing Satan. But then he puts a curse on women, and then he puts a curse on the earth itself. He puts a curse on Adam and Eve. Johnson tells a half-truth. Being evicted from the garden 
is God's judgment. But it is also his grace to stop us from living forever in sin. The two are not mutually exclusive. It's both. We're told in the Gospel of John, the Son did not come to the world to bring condemnation, but rather that through the believing of him, men shall find true salvation. It's true Jesus didn't come to condemn, but to save. But that does not mean people are not condemned. If they weren't condemned, they wouldn't need to be saved. Like all false teachers, Johnson para solzusins, as it were, to turn the Greek term into an English one. He puts truth next to error. That's how these people operate. Indeed, unless they did that, they couldn't operate. Bill Johnson is a deceiver. Yes, he targets young people because they tend to be naive, undiscerning, and in the present generation, lack scriptural knowledge and knowledge of doctrine. They've been told that discernment is being judgmental and unloving, which is the diametric opposite of what the New Testament actually teaches in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. To be loving, we must have knowledge of Scripture and be discerning. In any event, these things are all happening in the last days, just as we were warned they would. And Jacob, it, in, in this newsletter, in the Global Legacy newsletter, it goes on to say, um, the greatest victories of the kingdom are not because we fought well or ministered well, but because we learned how to do relationship well. Heaven's government was not intended to control wickedness, but to create a family, a society, a community in relationship with each other, a community that, that develops a shared vision. Of course, that meaning global vision. We want to create a, a family community, but not one that we manage with rules because that leads to control. No, we want it to be relational. And Jacob, that church, as well as Hillsong and many, many others, will use Galatians 5, verse 1, as a proof text to that. The freedom, the liberty, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled together with the yoke of bondage. But... Um, Paul, it's clearly told in Scripture that we don't use grace for an occasion to sin either. Okay, let's look at what they're doing. Once again, those remarks are plainly parasogzusin, putting truth next to error. To say it is not about fighting evil, but only about relationship instead, as if the two are mutually exclusive, is a lie. Jesus told people, well done, good and faithful servant. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Read 2 Corinthians, what Paul said. Ephesians 5, we're in a war against Satan. It says in Ecclesiastes, there's no discharge from this war. Johnson is a satanically inspired liar sent to deceive naive and undiscerning young people who lack a knowledge of the word of God. I will give account before the judgment seat of Christ for what I just said. That man is a satanically inspired liar sent by Satan to deceive young people. And as you say, Hillsong is a little different. But and let's focus, let's focus on this. How is fighting Satan at variance or in opposition to relationship? The two are not in opposition to each other. It's not either or. He puts the truth next to error. Now, as far as the citation of Galatians 5.1, again, taking the text out of context and making it a pretext. What Galatians 5.1 is speaking of in context was Jewish legalism permeating the church in Galatia, going back under the law. That's what it was talking about. There are, in fact, do's and don'ts, rules, if you will, in the New Testament, the same as there were in the Old. We have do's and don'ts, rules in the New Testament, the same as we do in the Old. 
What Johnson is doing is seducing people demonically into antinomianism, lawlessness. Now this is frightening. Because of lawlessness, most men's love will grow cold, Jesus said. Johnson is paving the way, setting up young people to swallow the bait of the Antichrist, hook, line, and sinker. Remember, at this point, as just as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the return of Jesus, the spirit of Antichrist, working through men like Johnson and Rick Warren, is preparing the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist, as the Holy Spirit is preparing the true church for the coming of Christ. The diametric opposite is also true. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist, and Bill Johnson is evidence of it. In fact, proof of it. And they are planting these churches worldwide. Um, the ones who, uh, global legacy is Bethel, but uh, at, this article comes from Anthony Hitler, who is in the UK under global legacy, as well as uh, Paul Manwaring, all Bethel, all learned at Bethel, all trained by Bethel. Okay, if anyone, any of those individuals who are deceived and who are deceiving others, which on television, on Roku television, in the presence of a Greek scholar and a Hebrew scholar, I will debate them doctrinally from the Word of God and prove what they are propagating are lies. And Jacob, how do we, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people, uh, my, my family included, um, we got our niece out of a Bethel church and they seem to be driven toward the entertainment. There's always stuff going on. Uh, yeah. um, I never saw that in scripture. They studied the word. And, and so they get into a, a good Bible teaching church and it's boring for them because they're, they're, they're seeing what they think is the, how, the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's not. It's just a bunch of uh, ruckus. Yeah. Uh, uh, the fruit the of the Spirit is not confusion. It's always the same. It's hype pretending to be anointing. It's entertainment pretending to be worship. It's the occult claiming to be charismata. It's all the same nonsense. But when you test it with scripture, the litmus test, the acid test, proves what it is, a lie of the devil. So how would you encourage parents and believers who have children that are stuck in these cult churches. Some have some have escaped uh, those, and thank God for that. How would you encourage uh, believing parents to be able to, to remove their children and friends from these cults? The Holy Spirit has to convict their children and show them. The only thing parents can do is pray and show them from the scriptures why it is wrong and try to help them find a healthy alternative. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you.